Right, nice. well, I will start then. But I'll start very slowly. <laughs> so, welcome to the July meeting of the OR and the Third Sector Special Interest Group. Um, in the change to what had been previously advertised, Louise is going to be talking about the pro bono scheme. Um, timetable is broadly similar to how we usually have on it, so I'll do a few brief introductory words. Louise will be talking. And then we've got questions shared by me, but Louise has said she's happy to have questions throughout her presentation, and we hope to be finished by three o'clock. Um, a word about our next event. Now, in the past, we've always said what this will be and the, and the dates, but at the moment, our plan is to hold our next event in October, um, and we're currently having discussions with potential speakers, um, but it's yet to be confirmed. Um, Uh, the topic speakers and registration details would be issued closer to the date. Um, so first, um, some questions about you. We've run these every time. Um, so a question about what your experience is, whether it's OR or analytical work. Sorry, OR or analytical work or commissioning OR from, from a third sector. Um, and then secondly, how your, what your experience with the third sector is. So Louise, do you want to run poll one? Yep. I'll just launch it. There we go. When we get how many responses are we? Uh, we've got we, we've just got a few people joining us. I've just admitted a couple yeah. of people, Malcolm. We'll leave it till they they come in. I think for, for those of the that have just joined us, we've just got a, a poll running. Hopefully you can see that. So everyone, how many are we expecting? One, two, three. I believe one person hasn't replied. One out of six. <laughs> who doesn't who doesn't want to tell us about them? So there we go. Okay. Oh, we go. I'll, end, I'll end the poll now. Yeah. Do you want to share it as well? Yeah. So um, five out of six people are doing OR analytical work and one person is doing analytical work and commissioning OR work. Um, and then on the second question, um, pretty much everyone is working as a charity volunteer um, and one person is working in humane core health areas so we, we've run this poll every time and i think we every time we've had a similar sort of response rate in terms of most people are analytical people rather than than um than uh than um third sector people now we're also running a second poll which is about your relationship with the pro bono scheme um and there's two um aspects to this is whether you're an analyst um, uh, I'm, so I've gone very really quiet there because it's is this the same poll it is isn't it no I haven't oh I'd, I have stopped sh oh I thought I'd stop sharing it there we go okay is that, close that one? Oh. Oh, Zoom's doing something very weird. Apologies. I might, no, that might have been me, actually. I keep, I keep closing it, but it keeps popping back up. <laughs> um, so the second poll is about your relationship with the, your knowledge and experience of the pro bono scheme. Um, and the responses are, are consist of two parts. is whether you're an analyst or a, a potential sponsor customer of the work. And then secondly, what your knowledge experience is. So that runs from very limited knowledge through to having participated within a pro bono project. Um, Louise, do you want to open that poll? Yeah. So 
You might, you might need to scroll a bit to have a look at all the questions to decide which ones you want or to Or even maximise it. There we go. Nearly there. We've got one person left to um, make their selection. There we go. OK, I'll end the poll and then I'll share the results. Yeah. So um, speaking a little in advance, um, there's actually a more variety of responses than I was expecting. I was expecting everybody to be analysts who have participated in the pro bono project. Um, but actually, it's only half of you are in that category. Um, we're another third in the, I am an analyst, I have signed up to CV months, but I haven't participated, and uh, only six, which is actually one person who is an analyst, um, and aware of the pro bono scheme, but not sure how to sign up. Um, I will be putting the link to how to sign up as a, as a volunteer in the chat function. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll do that after, well, as soon as um, Louise starts her talk. Um, so should we move on to? Yep, I'll stop sharing that. Yep. I was just gonna go and uh, get it now. So, yeah, so um, I'll hand over to Louise. Okay, thanks, Malcolm. Uh, afternoon, everyone. Uh, I recognise some names, so some of you know me, some of them I'm not sure if you know me. Um, I shall just share my, I shall start sharing my screen so you can see my slides and I'll introduce myself. There we go. Um, okay, so for those of you that don't know me, um, this is actually my third role with the OR Society um, as the pro bono OR manager. Previously, I've been the education officer. Um, I was actually the first education officer starting back in 2010. And then I moved on to be the strategic projects manager. Um, so that was a bit, bit more high level um, involved more with the board and strategic projects, membership, um, building our analytics offering at the time, those sorts of things, trying to reinvigorate the regional societies and special interest groups. Um, then I went on maternity leave and had a career break and I rejoined last year, last May, um, in this role to manage the pro bono scheme. So I'm getting, I'm getting a well-rounded education for the OR Society. <laughs> um, I do have a background in OR as well myself. I did my degree in management science and I've had analytical roles with DSTL and NPower. And I was doing outreach work with both of those organizations. And that's what prompted me to apply to become the education officer for the OR Society. Um, and build on my journey. Um, and as, as with most people in OR, I love knowing that my work makes a difference. Um, and this job, like all my other ones, does just that. So uh, I have, have a very nice, warm, uh, fuzzy feeling <laughs> doing this job, which is uh, lovely. Uh, usually when I'm given a presentation about pro bono OR, it is to introduce it and promote it to potential volunteers or potential charity clients. However, um, today's focus, I've made it slightly different, um, assuming um, and correctly assuming that most of you already know or are aware of the pro bono scheme. 
Um, so for those of you that haven't volunteered um, or haven't signed up yet, you can take this as a bit of a um, promotion and encouragement to come and volunteer. Um, and for those of you that have already volunteered or have been involved with projects, hopefully um, it'll be a little bit of food for thought and we can have a bit of a discussion at the end about the future of the scheme and, and what we might be able to do going forward to support the third sector. Um, so I'll just move on to the next slide. So I wanted to set the scene um, based on our theory of change. Uh, so we do practice what we preach. We have a theory of change to try and uh, uh, meet the aims of the pro bono scheme, which is that third sector organisations can do a better job, can improve outcomes, build capacity, all those great things that you can do with OR uh, by using the skills of volunteer analysts and consultants. And unsurprisingly, this obviously resonates with the vision, the overall vision of the OR Society, which is that we have a world improved by rigorous analysis and better evidence-based decision-making. Um, and in this world, you know, OR is not merely nice to have, but indispensable and used widely in all areas, including the third sector. So slowly but surely, we are doing this. Every pro bono OR project counts towards this. It's having a positive impact, um, whether that's in a small way or sometimes much bigger. But uh, yeah, so pro bono OR, ultimately trying to bring operational research to the third sector. <laughs> Our um, stretch goal as uh, to, to resonate with the OR and education one, which is that every school child knows what OR is. We want every third sector organisation to know what OR is. <laughs> um, just to kind of celebrate some of the achievements so far, uh, over 150 projects started since 2011. Um, that figure would actually be closer to 200 if we'd had a volunteer for every project that had been advertised. So there is appetite out there. Um, charities are finding us. And when, when they do hear about it, they are very keen and interested and excited to have a project scoped and see where it can take them. Um, and one of the, I think one of the really nice bonuses or benefits of the scheme in terms of, well, actually for both volunteers and charities, is the, the numbers of volunteers that end up working together on the projects. So this usually happens when more than one vo uh, volunteer applies for a project and we share those applications with the charity. Sometimes they, they say, oh, can we be cheeky and have all, all of the volunteers? Um, to which we, we go back to the volunteers and, and ask them if they'd like to work together. Um, or sometimes there's an obvious lead volunteer um, and there's some other volunteers who have applied who perhaps don't have enough experience to do it on their own. Um, in which case we then ask that lead volunteer if they would like to work with the others and have the support of the others and manage the team. And we've got a project um, happening right now with the NSPCC looking at um, the effect of climate change on child abuse. And we have a lead volunteer from the government OR service. But we also had two other volunteers. One's a student on placement with Gores and the other one is a recent graduate with Gores. So neither of those would have been able to do the project on their own, but because we have this lead volunteer, they've worked together as a team. So the, the student and the recent graduate have gained valuable skills and experience and the, the more experienced volunteer has obviously get, had that experience for leading a team as well. And they've developed connections between different government departments so that's a really lovely benefit for the volunteers, but also the charities are benefiting. Uh, they're getting this additional resource and input from the, the government volunteers. They get three volunteer days a year. So the NSPCC could have just had a project with, with three days worth of time, but they've actually had nine days worth of time, which I think is lovely. 
Um, so that's, that's some nice things. And uh, you can see the number of volunteers that worked on these projects. And um, quite a number of those are members of the OR Society. So it's, it's a really great um, scheme, a really good benefit of, um, of being a member and counts towards professional accreditation. Um, so all, all nice things there. Um, I just wanted to share some quotes as well from some recent projects. Um, I've got three to share with you uh, and I've picked hopefully three different sorts of projects um, to, to try and show the, the variety. So this one was a, a small quick project, um, a couple of days in terms of the, the volunteers involvement and short time period in that it was start to finish a month in terms of actually introductions, doing the project scope, setting the date for the workshop for the project and then writing up a report. So this one felt like it was a very quick project. Um, and it was working with the British Red Cross to identify potential improvements for its crisis response service. So all they, all they wanted with this project was a workshop and then a follow-up report which as you can see from the quote, has gave them the basis that they wanted to, um, I suppose, bring in, bring in some enthusiasm with the teams for working in this way. And hopefully they, they had a really good impression and um, had a good working relationship with the volunteer. So they could follow up with us in future to either build on this work or with a follow-up project. Uh, the second quote I want to share with you, this one's from a, a slightly longer, well, a longer project, but then it also had um, a follow-up project. So the volunteer completed the initial project, which was looking at analysing their existing membership data to try and help them move away from staying in that mindset of uh, looking at the anecdotal evidence um, and help them think more um, strategically about their membership, where, where they should have women's institutes open or close them, that sort of thing. And then it led to a follow-on project to analyze the most recent survey results and then provide advice on future data collection. So what, what questions might they ask in the future um, and then they also left the charity with that information and, and the tools and knowledge to then be able to carry out the work and conduct it in the future using their own resources and skills. And then the third one is, um, was a project that was looking at helping them with their volunteer recruitment strategy. Um, and this one looked specifically at mapping the clients and the volunteers in order to develop a strategy for their recruitment. And they wanted to make sure that they were re recruiting volunteers in the same areas as they had the, their client demand um, so that it matched up. But, uh, and the reason, one of the reasons I picked all three of those quotes was because they're all examples of leaving the organizations in a better position to help themselves in the future as well. So I feel like the pro bono scheme, not only are we raising awareness of operational research, we're getting them to think about um, perhaps how, the, how they could work better or bring operational research into their organization. The project itself then um, gives them you know, it gives them that the in, insight or the deliverables, the results of that project. But then rather than leaving them to rely on perhaps another pro bono project to do something, we're empowering them to, to take OR forward internally as well, which I think um, is really, really important. Uh, and what I wanted to do was just touch on what I feel like is a bit of a trend that's been happening over the last year or so. Um, although we do have a variety of pro bono projects and over the years, they've done pretty much everything from strategy planning down to data analysis, impact measurement, process improvement, options appraisal. 
the variety reflects the broad nature of the applications of OR. Um, but the last year or so, we've had many, many more requests for impact measurement. And the reasons for that have always been to support funding bids and strategy support. Um, and that's obviously not surprising given the changing and challenging environment in which charities are now operating. And that leads me into um, thinking now about the future of the, of the scheme. Um, and can we match what we have to offer uh, to charities and their needs in the context of the current environment? So here, I just wanted to share with you some research from the Charity Commission. Um, none of this, I, I think, will, will surprise anyone um, that charities um, experience negative impacts, and that's going to continue. Um, loss of income, and um, actually nearly half of them are now having to use their reserves to cope things like the charity shops um, and other traditional ways, closing and stopping. And more than half the charities were not back to their pre-pandemic funding levels by the end of 2021. Um, increased demand for their services, which is expected to continue. And um, more charities obviously relying on digital technology a lot of them were forced to go online um, and find their feet very quickly with digital technology. So there's an increasing need for digital skills among staff working in third sector organisations as well. And obviously, given the current levels of inflation, they're likely to erode charities reserves and the, fall, like the likely fall in living standards due to the increased cost of living um, is likely to create more demand, increased demand on the charity services and fundraising is more difficult. Um, and that's further highlighted by this other report, some other research. Um, I'll share this link at the end um, for you to go and have a look yourself and read in a little bit more detail. But CAF, the Charities Aid Foundation, they produce a UK given report every year. It's the largest study of giving behaviour in the UK. And um, we, have, we have a representative from the Charities Aid Foundation on the Pro Bono OR steering group, which provides some useful insight for us. Um, but two of their key findings, again, resonate with lack of funding and loss of income for, for charities. Um, giving in 2021, so last year, um, people were not giving as much money, it was still subdued. Donation levels were below the pre-pandemic figures. Um, one in eight people said they were considering cutting back on or reducing donations to charities. And that's in response to the rising cost of living. So this, this information, the previous slide, charities are going to need to do more with less. We've always known that. Um, I think charities know that. But even more so now, um, that, that need is, is more prominent. Um, Hopefully it will prompt some innovative approaches and new ways of doing things for a lot of charities. Um, people are going to have to start, <laughs> to put a phrase, thinking outside the box. Um, and perhaps this is where we can come in and position ourselves more. Can, is, is there more that we can do or do we need to do things differently? The challenge for the pro bono OR scheme is to help charities face these issues and find a way forward. So some things for us to consider. And i um, really happy for, for these to be questions that perhaps we discuss at the end of, of my, my presentation. Um, the feedback would be really nice to take back to the Pro Bono OR Steering Group Committee. Uh, but 
you know, are, are we in a position to be able to help charities take on this challenge? Do, you know, are the resources that we've got, um, the information that we give to volunteers, the way we set up the projects and scope them with the charities, are, you know, are we doing enough? Are, are, are we setting the bar at the right level for that? Um, which challenges can we most help with? I mean, we can't do, we'd love to do everything. We can't do everything. Should there be certain aspects that we focus on? Um, could we do more with focusing on certain skills and techniques, either to, to communicate to the charities and third sector organisations themselves to help them upskill their workforce? Um, or are there particular skills or techniques that we should be looking from, for, for, for from our volunteers and perhaps highlighting what we want our volunteers to be doing? Um, and uh, you know, how do we best persuade charities that we can make a real difference? I think at the moment, I, I think that um, they'll happily take anything that might help, but how do we stand out against all the other pro bono offers that are out there? And how do we help them decide that ours is the best offering to go for? Um, and we can maybe give them the most input or the you know, most outcome for the time they've got to invest in this project. Um, you know, we've got an opportunity to help these organisations um, inform decisions around the change that they might have had to make over the last couple of years. More charities and quite possibly the smaller ones that have grown rapidly in terms of the services that they're offering during the pandemic. They've now got more data. Are they looking at what they can do with that data? Um, perhaps now they're, they're starting to think about how that data could be analysed to drive efficiencies. They, can't, they can no longer rely on anecdotal or overall impressions that they're doing the right thing, um, especially if funding is, is harder to get hold of. Um, if that pot of money is smaller, you've got to fight harder to get that money. Um, so you've really got to make yourself stand out and numbers are a, a good way to do that. Um, so I think, you know, we've got a couple of challenges for the pro bono OR scheme uh, that comes out of that. All the two previous slides that I've just talked about none of those things are small projects. So the big challenge for us, the pro bono OR scheme, may be how we manage expectations um, with the charities and third sector organisations, especially when we are promoting the scheme and talking about all the great things that OR can do and can help them with. But then can we deliver that? It's not guaranteed because we don't know who's going to apply to volunteer to, to undertake that project. Um, so we need to try and deliver positive outcomes for charities with limited volunteer time. You know, people are finding that they've got less time to be able to, to perhaps offer to the pro bono scheme. Maybe their, their day job, their current workload is increased. Life is getting back to what we call normal or pre-pandemic levels, people are feeling busier. Um, so I think we've got less volunteer time to still try and deliver what it is that we'd like to deliver to meet our aims and, and deliver the outcomes and goals for the scheme. So we really need volunteer engagement to achieve this, but we need active and engaged volunteers. Perhaps one of the ways we could do this is to to make pro bono OR be seen or regarded more as an important tool for continuing professional development, um, especially for OR practitioners, maybe for other professional groups. Do we make it you know, a requirement for gaining perhaps fellow level accreditation? At the moment, it counts towards professional accreditation, but you know, if you want to be a fellow of the OR Society, should you really have 
I mean, would it be reasonable to expect that someone do a pro bono project in order to be a fellow? Um, even possibly count towards chartered scientist status could be incentives to um, more effective participation in the scheme. But do we need to work with employers as well to make offer more volunteer time or perhaps allow a bit more flexibility in terms of uh, crossover between the volunteer time and using work time, um, especially if the volunteer can make use of their colleagues. So I've had a couple of projects recently where I'm aware that the employer has been very supportive of the volunteers and they've actually, the volunteers have been able to call upon their colleagues. So the colleagues haven't been officially part of the pro bono team, but if they've wanted some quality assurance or a bit of help, so I've, got, I've had one project where the volunteer um, needed a little bit more help in terms of the stats side of things and their employer was more than happy for them to go and spend a little bit of time with colleagues who had that stats experience. So is this something we can do with, with employers and um, making a pro bono project and volunteer time a bit more integrated and flexible and perhaps part of their um, professional development and annual appraisals. So lots of food for thought, lots of things to think about. And I started off with our theory of change and what our ultimate goal was. And so tie it back in, in order to be able to realize those benefits and meet that aim, it's the activities that we do at the OR Society and those are the volunteers that are going to enable that. Um, so yeah, over, over to you to see what you think. Um, before, before I open up to, to questions and um, any, any other comments that people want to say, I just wanted to um, talk about maybe other OR societies and whether we think they should be offering pro bono and should we be encouraging them to. So INFORMS, um, hopefully you're all aware of INFORMS, the US um, Operational Research Society, they actually started their pro bono analytics scheme following ours. So they, they saw what we'd done. They liaised with, it was Felicity back then, um, who was a pro bono manager. They liaised with her and set up their one. So, um, you no, know, should we be encouraging the other European OR societies to set up some pro bono schemes and help tackle some of these issues as well? So another question for you. Um, and I think that's it from me. If, uh, if, if you want to find out, some <laughs> we do have some questions on chat. Okay. Um, and I shall take them in reverse order because it's easier to scroll that way. Um, so the first one is from that, Andrew. Um, do you have any information on what if other volunteering, the pro bono volunteers do after their formal pro bono project? Okay, yes. Yeah, so most volunteers, I think, do do a project and then go back to their day job. Um, we've had I have several volunteers who apply for other projects. So we have we have a, a number of volunteers who have obviously had a very good experience, enjoy doing it, have the time and capacity to do it, um, and come back and apply. I've got I've got a couple of volunteers. On current projects who have previously volunteered over the years. I think this might be about whether they've done work possibly for the same organization that's not but not part of that's beyond the original project. Uh, yes um, oh so one I know um, actually stayed on to be an advisor for the charity that they were involved in um, that was Dan Tilly. He he ended up actually yeah. setting up his own consultancy and and doing really well. Um, and some of them we have follow on have follow on projects. So the the Women's Institute one that was one where they the charity asked the volunteer if they would be interested in some follow on work. Um, well, and... me as me as well to be honest. But um, so I know that I know that Felicity knew about that, but I don't know whether it was sort of recorded or. 
Oh no, what you stayed on as well, Malcolm, did you too? Yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah. It, it does happen. Um, oh, it's not I think that we recall... person became the trustee of the charity. Yeah, yeah. It's not something that we record formally, but perhaps we should because it's they're, they're nice, <laughs> nice things to know, aren't they? Okay. Um, scrolling up, if I can. Um, I might have to maximise. Um, so there's a question about um, mapping between emerging charity needs in terms of skill and experience and the six or other groupings within our society. Um, how might that affect how this SIG markets itself through those groupings? Now, it's interesting that I was actually scribbling when Louise was talking about some of the um, challenges that pro bono could be looking at in the third sectors scribbling them down and adding them to so we can add them to our third sector SIG list. Um, but the first part of that question was about mapping with other other SIGs within the society. Yeah, that's um, at our last steering group committee meeting, we um, did bring that up as a possible way to find other volunteers. Um, yes, because uh, we need the volunteers <laughs> to, to be able to to keep this scheme going uh, and make it work uh, but yeah that's something we can definitely we've talked about um, and I think it's something we we do need to do and could do in terms of um, looking at the other SIGs and groups within the OR society. Okay the next question actually is probably at me really is how could this SIG market itself in, use in terms of how enrollment might contribute to, for example, higher stages of professional membership? Um, I'm not sure about the second half of that, but we are looking to see how we're um, attracting people to our Zoom meetings because um, our Zoom meeting turnout has been a bit disappointing. Um, I mean, today seems to be a particularly disappointing example, but um, the two Zoom meetings we've had before have had been about 20 or 30 people. Whereas when we had meetings in London, we used to get quite often get 30, 30 or 40. Uh, oh, another one is someone says they've got other questions. Andrew has appeared. Hello, Andrew. Can you hear me? Did I, did I interpret your question correctly in terms of other work. Um, well, I was interested in all possible follow-ups, actually. Okay. Okay. And uh, I asked partly because it may imply that there's actually a, a bigger interested resource than the, there might appear immediately. People, my guess is that many people. Um, <laughs> but from my own experience, do a bit of volunteering and see opportunities. They, they start to see where they could contribute something. But um, after a while, may start to spot their own areas or areas of personal interest or passion that they follow rather than be um, sort of stick to a standard pro bono short consultancy model but that, that doesn't mean they're not necessarily interested in helping in some way uh, just the, the kind of moving beyond <laughs> the short consultancy um, model and if one if we knew a bit more about how many people of that kind there might be it might be by getting some of those together more you could uh, one get some extra advisory resource but to also spot opportunities. Yeah, that, for those, for those I'm, who I'm don't just know, say, that, sorry, I was going to, I was going to add. For those of you who don't know, my my path started off. I was, I, I did a few, I did a little bit of pro bono um, consultancy work on my own, and then I was part of setting up the pro bono R scheme. Um, and then I did various other things, and for the last 10 years I've been working pro bono in Uganda with a, with, with a rural health provider, which is a rather extreme version, but um, 
there are a lot of possible paths that people might take that eventually lose contact. Um, yes, and what I've started doing when I um, have a closure have a closure meeting to capture feedback with the pro with the project client with the client and volunteer I always make a point of saying that it's okay for them to stay in touch informally um, it's okay if they identify other opportunities for projects and things like that um, if the charity want to come back to us with another project if the volunteer go. so i'm trying to keep the doors open but in terms of capturing what people are doing beyond their pro bono project we don't currently capture yeah. that information but i can i can see where you're going with that and the the insight that that could give us and the, how useful that could be Okay, hey, any more questions? Um, so Louise had another question. She said she's got lots of questions. That's yes, fine, Louise. <laughs> um, she's interested in how she can best contribute because she's okay, new right. to this special interest group. Well, I, th I think, um, well, if, if specifically you're interested, Louise, in the pro bono scheme, then I'm happy for you and I to catch up separately and we can have a call and I can go into a lot more detail with you about pro bono. And if you're um, interested in the SIG, then contact me and we can sort something out. Get you on we the can, committee. We are, we <laughs> are looking at meetings. committee meetings and we continually trawl and we continually get a small response, i.e. zero. Yeah, so um, Louise has done a follow-up question there, Malcolm, that you might want to try and answer. What's that? Uh, Scale of the ambition for you for this thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, well, we'd like to change the world. Um, is that is that scale enough? Um, bear in mind, we 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 were quiet. We we had no activities at all for two years because of the pandemic. Um, this is our third Zoom meeting since we resumed them back in March. Um, and as I said, a bit disappointed about the turnout that we've had um, in all of the meetings, um, because there's a lot less than it used to be um, when we had meetings in London. Um, and we were saying before that we let everybody in that um, I can see the, the, the attractions of, of going to a meeting and attaching a day out in London. Plus, we used to have free plonk at the end, which always a bit of a plus. Um, so, um, yeah, so I'm going to be sending out a questionnaire to the people, a couple of questionnaires actually, in the next month or two, ideally by, by the beginning of September. Um, so one is to all of the people that have attended the meetings, the three meetings that we've had, asking them for general feedback on, on how they felt it went and so on and so on, and, but also what they'd like to see in the future. Um, but also, and possibly more importantly, is sending a questionnaire to the whole of the SIG those who haven't been coming to the meetings to find out why they've, they've not been attending. Um, I mean, it may be just that people are not very Zoom, Zoom happy. Okay, so any more questions? If not, I suppose we could play the meeting closed. Any more questions? We'll take that as a no. No. Okay, so thank you to Louise for talking and thank you to everybody else for, for, for logging in and attending. Um, I'll just let Louise, um, Louise, I've got your email address, so I'll follow up with you. Yeah, I've just copied that as well. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Have a good afternoon. Enjoy the sun.